to start. All right, today we're going to try to do both add, subtract, and then multiply, divide of rational numbers. The, I, to be honest with you, the hardest part is how to teach them using pictures or manipulatives. Because we know how to do it, hopefully. If I gave you this equation, how would you add those two fractions? What would you do? What's the rule for adding fractions, for adding or subtraction of fractions? What's the main rule? Exactly, yes. You must have the same denominators. Because if they're not the same, that means the pieces of the pie aren't the same. You can't compare them. Like the example we had last time, we had one third and one half. They weren't the same, so we couldn't compare them. Let's go back to that example. We had <clears throat> we had one third of a piece of pie and one half of a let's say a lasagna. That's one piece out of three and one piece out of two. Are they equal? How do we know they're not equal? But the kids don't care because if it makes the picture big enough, I'll make them the same size. Mathematically, how do we prove they're not the same? Because you're right. And this goes along with the idea we have to have the same denominator. It has to be the same size pictures before us compare. But how do we prove that these two numbers are not equal? You haven't time decimals yet. Remember we did cross multiplication. So we have one times two and one times three. Is two equal to three? No. So what we just did there actually plays a big role in how we add and subtract fractions. What we just did there. Once we have the same denominator, the only thing we have to worry about are the top numbers. How about this one? Hmm? Well, yeah, well, how would you work it out? Okay. 
but what's wrong with that? Because remember, we define fractions as part over whole or total. How can we, we haven't learned decimals yet, so we can't use decimals. That's why you can't use calculators, because they don't deal with fractions. So how would you teach this? How would you demonstrate to the kids? Because we have to look at both of these possible answers. What kind of fraction is this? It has got a name. I'll give you a hint. These are the initials. And this one and the other one is so what defines proper, what defines improper? So which one's that? Right, because as we see here, the top number is bigger than the bottom. If the numerator is larger than the denominator, it's an improper fraction. If the numerator is less than the bottom number, it's a proper fraction. It's also got a property. Proper fractions, which is top less than the bottom, what's the answer going to be? If we have a proper fraction, what's the answer always going to be for proper fractions? Yep. Proper fractions are less than one. Improper fractions are always greater than one. So how would you prove that? How would you prove that 3 over 5 as opposed to 7 over 5? This one's going to be less than 1, and this one's going to be greater than 1. How are you going to prove that to the kids without using a calculator? They'll give you a, a decimal. We haven't learned decimals yet. We haven't really talked about division in that whole matter of fact. How would you do a number line? Yeah, we could do that, but is there an easier way that the kids can see much easier readily? What does the bottom number represent? Yeah, so we have an entire thing. It's made up of how many blocks? Mm -hmm. 
one, two, three, four, five. So that's as many blocks as we can use. This equals one entire block. But we only want to use three of them. So did we use the entire block? No, we use less than the entire block. So therefore, it's less than one. If the top number is smaller than the, than the bottom, then it's going to be less than one entire thing. In the second one, remember we have five pieces in our block. This equals one, one units of five, but we want to use seven of them. That's one, that's two. That's three. That's four. That's five. We need more. How many more do we need? So we need another block. Each one of our blocks has to have five pieces in it. And we need two more. So this is going to be number six, and that's going to be seven. So if we had five blocks out of five, that equals what? And then we have two out of five blocks. So this equals, so seven over five is equal to one plus two fifths, which we learn how to write as that. And that's called a what? What kind of number is this? It's a whole number or an integer. What kind of number is this? Rational. So a number that is a whole and rational, it's called a mixed number. Because it's, made, it's mixed up of both things. All right, so now we can go to a definition of adding of the addition of rational numbers with like denominators. With like denominators, I mean, the bottom numbers have to be the same. So we're saying that if A over B and C over B are proper fractions,
And that's you remember what proper fractions are. So the numerator A is less than B and C is less than B. That's what proper means. The top number is smaller than the bottom number. Then A over B plus C over B, since the bottom number is the same, we just wrote it right at once. And there's a definition. What do you see as the most logical question a student might ask? Exactly. Exactly. How would you answer that? You asked your own question that got you stumped. Why isn't it B plus B on the bottom also? I can only have two slices in the three slices when I cut. I can't have uh, five pieces of pizza because it's not two pieces of it. We split it up into like separate parts, I guess. Kind of, yes. But you have to say it, you have to put it in a form the kids are going to understand. How would you draw that in the picture? Because we had two fifths plus one fifth. So if we have a pizza, we cut it into five equal pieces. We have another one. We cut it into five pieces. They're all the same size. So now that you have both of these, I took two out of the first one. I took one out of the second one. Each piece is how big? Yeah, each piece is one fifth of the entire picture. So I have one fifth, another fifth, and another fifth. So it's one fifth plus one fifth plus one fifth. They're all fifths. I have three of those fifths. So that's how you, you explain it to them because each size is going to be the same. Which is why I wouldn't work with that first one. We had the three, the pizza that's cut into three pieces and the lasagna that's cut in half because the pieces are not the same. Right here, yeah. But now, this means nothing to kids. When you put that up there, it's really not going to mean anything to them. They need to see pictures first. Are you trying to say that for the A plus C? We put a plus oh, B. that's what I said. There's a misprint. My spell checker checked it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, again, you see now why this is going to be a difficult concept to teach your kids. And you can't skim over it. Stay on it. As, and if you don't know, then just say, hey, let's find out. Start putting things together. And to be honest with you, students will learn. If, if I give you a worksheet and ask you to fill it out, or if I give you a worksheet that I filled out with mistakes in there, which one do you think is going to be more instructive to you? No, the one, yeah, the one has all the mistakes because that tests, you have to work through step by step by step yourself. That's the only way you'll know if something's wrong. Because if, if I give you the blank sheet, 
you could be working out. If you make a mistake, you won't know it till I grade, grade it. But this one here, you have to check, make sure, okay, I didn't get this. They got this. Who's wrong? So you can check it. So working it out step by step and figure out if you make a mistake, the, if the kids follow or follow you, they'll correct you. That's when the most learning is going to occur. If you ever watched uh, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, he always did that. He always made little mistakes. I said, oh, I shouldn't, this doesn't go here. This has to go here because it's showing what the kids already know. So bats with like denominators. Let's see if we have an example here. Yeah. So now how about the definition of addition of rational numbers with unlike denominators. As you see, mathematics is built on a lot of words, a lot of definitions. If the kid doesn't, if the student doesn't know the word denominator, is any of this stuff going to matter to them? No. So you have to make sure they understand what a numerator is, what the and that's going to be hard in itself, especially if you have ESL students. Not just Spanish. I'm talking about you teaching some districts where Korean is primary language or Vietnamese or Arabic. So here we have the same thing. If A over B and C over B, or C over D, it has to be different bottoms, are unlike rational numbers then A over B plus C over D is equal to AD plus CB over BD. Okay, that's the formula. Now you have to teach, tell the students where you got it from. Remember how we tested to see if A over B equals C over D, what do we do? We cross multiplied. So that's A times D. B times C. Well, that's exactly what we have on top. A, B. So we're putting them together. So we change that to a plus because we're adding them. Because we multiplied across, now let's multiply straight across for the bottom. That's where we get the B, D from. But again, that's going to confuse your students a whole bunch. I've had graduate students who've never seen the butterfly method. I love the butterfly method. Especially kids will love it too because you get to draw a picture of a butterfly. There's his antenna. There's his head, and there's his tail. Multiply straight across. So that's CB, A times D. 
in the head goes the whatever operations there. In the bottom, multiply these two. So you have AD plus CD over BD. This is going to stick to students a lot more than making them memorize a formula like that. I, I have graduate students who said if they would have learned how to add subtractive fractions like this, they would have done much better in school. But you have to make sure the students know how to do what first to make this thing work. They have to, exactly. They have to remember how to multiply and add. Addition will be an easy one for them. So that's, but multiplication, that's going to be the more difficult one. Three fourths plus one fifth. So using the butterfly method, so what goes under the first antenna? Three times five is 15. In the head is the operation, which is plus in this case. And then four times one is four. On the bottom, four times five. So we have 15 plus 4 over 20. And there you go. The fewer things you teach your students, the better. We can use, we can just teach them this for both types of fractions, like and unlike denominators. Let's look at this. If we had A over B plus C over B, let's work this out using the butterfly method. So in the first print antenna, we have A times B. This is plus. Then we have C times B. On the bottom, we have B times B is B times B. We haven't talked about exponents yet, so it's B times B. So AB plus CB over B times B. Earlier chapters, we talked about the different properties, commutative, associative, distributive. Before that, we talked about the, uh, the uh, distributive property. The distributive property was this.
that's going this way, going that way. What if we go from started from here, we go to here? What do they both have in common? We have an A, so we take out we're gonna take out an A. If we take out the A out of both of these, what do we have left? X plus Y. So we do the same thing here. On the top, what do they have in common? They have a B, so I take away one, the B. And so I have left A plus C. So we have B times this and B times that. So both of these Bs, since they're multiplied, we can cancel them out. What we have here is B over B times A plus C over B. And there you have our the rule for like fractions, like denominators. So you tell tell your students just memorize one formula, just that one. All right, let's look at some examples here. Example six, we have A, two over 15 plus four over 21. Before you start adding, what should, should you do? What should you check first? Well, well, yeah, look at the denominators. But first, before you do anything, see if anything you can simplify. Because before you add and multiply numbers, see if you can cancel anything first. See if anything cancels top and bottom. 2 and 15? No. 4 and 21? No. So always check that because if you, if they, if it can simplify, it'll make the answer easier. So now what do we do? Since we're adding. So we got 2 times 21 is 42, 5, 15 times 4 is 60. Add them together, we get 102 over 315. What do we know about both of those numbers? Are they divisible by two? Are they divisible by three? Por que no? The rule for division by three, that's why I gave you that sheet a couple weeks back. If you add up all the digits, if that sum is divisible by three, then the number is divisible by three. 
one plus zero plus two is three. Three plus one is four plus five is nine. They're both divisible by three. So we know that three goes into both of them. So let's look at this. Three goes into 10 how many times? Three with one left over. Three goes into 12. Four. So we have 34 times three is one or two. How many times does three go into three? Once. Three does not go into zero, uh, into one, so it's a zero there. But three goes into 15 five times. So the threes cancel. What we end up with is that. Is there another way we could have done it? This is a sub two. Two over 15 plus four over 21. Is there another way we could have done it? Yes, but we we have big numbers that way. Let's see how they're different. 15 is made up of what? 21 is made up of? So they both have a 3 in common. This one has a 5. This one needs a 5. This one has a seven. This one doesn't. This one needs a seven. Least common multiple rule. So two times seven is 14. What's 15 times seven? One oh five. Four times five is twenty. Twenty one times five is one oh five. They both have the same bottom number, so I add the top. We got the same answer both ways. It's whatever's easier for you and the students. One of them involved division. That's if your students are strong in division. The other one with factoring first, finding the LCM, which is what we did a few weeks ago. B, 2 over negative 3 plus 1 over 5. How do we do this? We have a rule in math that says that if you have a... a a sign on your fraction, that sign belongs to which number? Top or bottom? Right, the top number. The case, the reason for this, 
is if we had, say, 2 over 5 plus negative 3 over 5, the only way an answer could be negative is if the top is negative. Because once you get a common denominator, then you just add the top. If this one was negative, we couldn't, then we get negative five, five, we get negative number. So no. So if you have a negative number, move it to the top. We have unlike denominators. We can't go any further with those factoring. So here we could do the butterfly method. Five times negative two is what? Yeah, so it's positive times negative is a negative. Two times five is 10, so it's a negative 10. The operation is a plus. Three times one is three. On the bottom, three times five is 15. We have negative 10 plus three. We have opposite and signs. What's the rule if you have opposite signs? Take the sign of the larger number, which is 10. So the answer is going to be negative. 10 minus 3 is 7 over 15. What does that parenthesis tell us to do? Yeah, we have to do these first. And what's that called? Order of operation. Yeah. You see how important it is to start with that and they have to know these things? So once they see parentheses, I got to do that first. So they have to do this operation first. The butterfly method, when the kid does, when the student does that at home and the parents see it, then they get fascinated by it. They like it. And then that, now they have a better understanding of fractions and they don't mind helping the kids there. So again, this is not a commonly practiced thing. It's out there, but I like to use it. Five times three is 15. The operation is a plus. Four times one is four. Four times five is 20. So in the parenthesis, we have 15 plus four over 20. So we have 19 over 20 plus one over six. We don't need the parentheses anymore. It's one number inside there. Now, here you have the option of going one of two ways. If we do the butterfly method, then we have to, do we have to divide at the end to simplify to see what they have in common. Or we can do the LCM method now, and that'll take care of the, the division part. Which part do you want to do? Okay, so we got to find out what is six made up of? 
So 20 doesn't have a three. So once we, does 20 have a two in it? Yeah, so two times 10. So how are they different? They both have a two, so that's not the difference. This one has a 10, this one needs a 10. This one has a three, this one needs a three. So we have 19 times three over 60. One times 10 over 60. Nine times three is 27. Three plus two is five, so it's 57. Plus 10 is 67 over 60. And since we haven't really introduced mixed numbers per se, we'll have them leave it like that alone. So far, so good. Yeah, a lot of, you know, the LCM method is busy at the beginning, but it's easy at the end. The butterfly method is easy at the first, but busy at the end. It's whatever you see the students' strengths are at. Any questions so far? Let's look at D. Do we always have to have numbers? No, we can have something like this. Three over X plus four over Y. So you want to use LCM or butterfly method? Okay. Butterfly method is here because since it's letters on the bottom, nothing is going to cancel, really. So we do the butterfly method. But if you choose to use the other method, you'll get the same answer. We can't use the LCM, really, because X doesn't break down in anything. So three times y is three y. The operation is a plus. Four times x is four x. And then on the bottom, x y. That's as far as we can go. And this is where you also stress to your students that whenever you have numbers and letters, the numbers always go first. The letters always follow. And you teach them another word. What is a number in front of a letter called? Very good. It's a coefficient. What grade do you think is going to learn that word? Are you even able to pronounce it? <laughs> well, it's hopefully around fourth or fifth grade, but yeah, the last students don't see it until after middle school. Let's see. E. Two over A squared over B plus three AB squared.
I know you're looking at this saying, wow, this one doesn't look fun. Can you break down the bottom into anything, into smaller pieces? Well, yeah. What does A squared B broke really mean? It means A times A times B. This is A times B times B. So we use the LCM here. How are they different? They both have one A and they both have one B. So what's different? This one has an extra A. So this one needs an extra A. The second one has a B. So the first one needs a B over B. Why do we multiply by B over B and A over A? What is B over B? One. When you multiply something by one, do you change the number? Anything times one is itself. So I'm not changing the number. I'm just changing the way it looks. So we have 2B. We have A times A, B times B. 3A. We have A times A, B times B. So we have 2B plus 3A. And they both have two A's and two B's. Yeah, again, of course, before you do that, you have to teach them what exponents are. A times A is the same thing as A squared. So A times A is A squared. B times B is B squared. So again, that's that's in the later elementary school grades, junior high area. Yeah? Yes, that's very true. The concept of like terms. And hopefully you did with that earlier when we do the discussion is we cannot add 3x plus 3y because apples and oranges. They don't taste the same, so you can't put them together. Very, very good. Yes, very good. And you also have to tell them, well, why can't we cancel one of these and one of those? Hmm? No. What if we had this? 3 plus 5 over 3. The students are going to say, well, why can't we cancel the 3s? What does that matter? Right, because yeah, when we people multiplication effect, yes, you said you can only cancel if they're multiplying. What's another way with what we just talked about today? What's another? How can we split these up? If you have one number or one term on the bottom, because yeah, what this is. Remember, if you have a common denominator, you can combine them like this. So 3 divided by 3 is 1. That's what you end up with. That's why you can't, if you cancel these, what you're going to end up with is 3 goes into 3 once. You're going to end up with 6. Is that equal 6? No. So it's not equal, so you can't do it. And that's where you stress the fact that you can't do something unless there's a rule of math that says you can. And that's why it's important to teach the rules early. Because I can't, I can't tell you, the, the biggest problem I see with students in college is they don't know the rules. They just learned 
how to do it, not why to do it or when to do it. Order of operations, because they were always memorizing PEMDAS. PEMDAS is what you use in elementary school. But once you finish elementary school, that should be gone. We should now learn how to do order of operations. Now we're going to go into the concept of mixed numbers. What is a mixed number? It's an integer. and a proper fraction. The two types of numbers are mixed. So it could be two and one third or negative three and two fifths. So where do the improper fractions come from? I mean, where do mixed numbers? Where do mixed numbers come from? <laughs> come from improper fractions. So then you have to go back and remember what is an improper fraction? It's where the numerator is bigger than the denominator. The top number is bigger than the bottom number. Five over two. So how many times does two go into five? Yeah, two times. With how many left over? So there's one left over over two. Another way you can show it to them is this. So we have one half. This is the how, how big it's cut up. We have five of those. So we have one half plus one half plus one half. We have one, two, three, four. We have five of one halves. What is one half plus one half? One. One half plus one half is one. And then the half. One plus one is two. Two plus a half is two and a half. So that's how you, that's one way you can introduce them and show it to them. This is what it means. That's, that's how we, it's improper fraction is because the bottom number can fit in there a couple of times. And the more ways you're going to see the same thing, the students have a better understanding. They could test their knowledge of multiplication, division, and stuff like that. Okay, so that's how I, I can go from improper fraction to mixed number. How do I go backwards? How would I go from, let's say, two and three fourths? How would I convert that? This is a mixed number. There's mixed numbers. And improper fractions go together. Since they go, since they're the same thing, how do I convert them? We did earlier, let's say we had 11 over 4. That's the improper fraction, right? How many times does 4 go into 11? We have 4 plus 4 is 8. And then there's 3 left. 
So it's there's two of those. So it's two and three fourths. Because we can add numbers like this together. They just become the, the mixed number. That's the easy way. How many times does this go into there? But now let's go from here to there. How do we do that? Well, this in reverse. We know we have two plus three fourths. We can split them up. Two is a fraction. If we did the butterfly method here, what are we going to get? We get two times four is eight. One times three is three. Four times one is four. So we have eight plus three over four, which is 11 fourths. That's how we convert them. We split them up and then make the integer into a fraction and then add the, get a common denominator, add, add the numbers together. Five and two thirds. So this is the same thing as five plus two over three. So that's Five over one plus two over three. Do the butterfly method. Five times three is 15. One times two is two. We get 15 plus two over three. So it's 17 over 3. All right. So what's really happening is this. When we separate these two, we have to get a common denominator, right? What's the common denominator between 1 and 3? It's whatever this one is, because under the whole number is always going to be a one. So this one needs a three over three. We know the three is going to be the bottom number. It's always going to be the bottom number. So five times three is 15 plus two is 17 over three. So you notice we got five times three plus two, that gives us our 17. Where did that three come from? From the bottom. So the shortcut is what we just did here. Take this number and multiply it by three. So it's A times C. And then we added the top number, which is B. And there's your conversion factor. That's how you convert from mixed number to improper fraction. Example seven, we have four and one thirds 
and negative three and two fifths. Just by looking, we know what the bottom numbers are going to be. What's the bottom number going to be in the first one? Three. And the second one? Yeah, so the bottom numbers never change. So we have the integer times the bottom number. So it's four times three plus the top number. 12 plus one over three is equal to 13 over three. Do you think this negative sign changes anything here? All it means is we're going to have a negative answer. Three times five plus two. So the answer is going to be negative. Fifteen plus two. Negative fifteen plus two is seventeen. Negative seventeen over five. Nothing changes. If it's a negative, the negative just goes out in front. Don't worry about it. Any questions about those? Yeah, so if we just follow this rule here, you can never go wrong. And if if A is negative, it's just that. The negative just goes out in front. Because no one particular number is negative. It just means the whole thing is negative. All right. Example eight is converting, with, which we've done before. Convert that to a mixed number. So how many times does five go into 39? Five, 10, 15. Yeah, seven times five is 35. How many left over do you have? 39 minus 35 is four. Because seven times five is 35, we have four left over.
adding mixed numbers. And so we had A, B over C plus D, E over F. When you're, because remember one thing. Remember earlier when we looked at improper fraction, I mean, mixed numbers like this, we can split them up. Remember that? We can do the same thing here. So this one becomes A plus B over C plus D plus E over F. I can split them all up. I can group them together. So I can go A plus D, since they're the numbers, solid numbers, I can add them together. Then I can add the fractions. And once I get that, it's whatever they are. It's A plus D times BF plus EC over CF. Remember the rule. I multiply these two together, these two together, and then these two together. And then there's your answer. So if I had, here's an example. Two and two thirds plus one and one and one half. I can split them up, add the whole numbers. So two times two, one times three, three times two. I took these two, multiply them together, multiply them together, multiply them together. Four plus three over six. Can we leave it like this? No, because it's improper fraction. You always, always end up with proper fractions and mixed numbers. So we have to convert this improper to a mixed number. What is, how many times does six go into seven? With how many left over? So we have three plus one plus one over six makes it four, one over six.
additive inverse. What is an additive inverse? If you, if you have to think about the words, what is the additive inverse? What's inverse mean? Opposite. So if I had a number three, what's the additive inverse? What's the opposite of three? Yeah, so my additive inverse is what would make it equal zero? That's the additive inverse. What would it take? So, it's, so basically, it's the same number, opposite sign. with the opposite sign. So the additive inverse of negative two thirds would be positive two thirds. You see why it equals zero? Because we have a common denominator, we just take the top. As long as the top is equal to zero, the whole thing equals zero. You cannot have the bottom equal zero. All right, so the additive inverse of negative four thirds is what? Negative four and one thirds? Yep. Positive four and one third. Or positive 13 over three. They're both the same thing. The addition property of equality. This is a theorem. Theorem 6-7. The addition property of equality. It's pretty straightforward. If I had two fractions, A over B and C over D, and they're equal, they're the same thing. If I add the same fraction to both sides, they're still going to be equal. That's what it says. So if I had two thirds and that equals two thirds and I add X over Y here, what do I have to have? We'll have to add over here to make the same. Over y, yeah. That's that's all it tells you is if I if two fractions are equal, that means if I add or subtract anything to both sides, that's going to be the same answer. And the subtraction of those numbers are the same thing. says A over B minus C over D, or C over B equals A minus C over B. All we're going to do is if we change the sign, it just changes the sign in our equation. Everything else is the same. And we subtract instead of add. So that's the beauty of subtraction and addition. It's the same thing, just change the sign. All right. That does it for that section. I was kind of hoping to do both of them today, but nope.